they thought of him as a model son. He really was the last person you would associate with something like this. They stayed at one of the better hotels in New York and had a very expensive holiday. It was clear now that money was no object uh, to Brian. On Sunday, July the 25th, 2004, in a quiet suburb of Liverpool, public schoolboy Brian Blackwell kills his parents in an horrific attack at their home. Brian Blackwell then leaves the bodies where they've been killed and takes his girlfriend on a holiday of a lifetime to America. What amazing web of lies did this young boy create that ultimately led him to take the lives of his doting parents so brutally and then act as if nothing had happened? This is the story of how a brilliant teenage student became a killer, including for the first time his chilling confession to the killings. And I struck him with the soft side of the hammer. I'm not sure who exactly I've struck, where, how many times. I couldn't believe that someone would have died so easily. Brian Sr. met his future wife Jacqueline in the late 1960s, when they both worked as buyers for Littlewood stores in Liverpool. They married 20 years later, after both had divorced from their previous marriages and after the birth of their son, Brian. Brian was the uh, only child of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Blackwell, although uh, Brian's father had two much older children from a previous marriage. They lived in a, in a nice, quiet uh, village area of, uh, just outside Melling, which is near towards Lancashire uh, area. He was uh, a very bright child, very nice child by all accounts, and uh, widely thought of by um, friends of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Backwell as a very nice, uh, pleasant, polite, uh, bright young man. They thought of him as a model son. Brian was a very good student, very able. He worked hard, uh, particularly good at languages and sciences, and was very keen to become a doctor. Um, so I think right the way through his time with us, he was with us from year eight, Brian uh, was regarded as one of our, our high flyers, as it were. Brian's success at school led his parents to give him the nickname Brains. But the perfect family image was beginning to crack as Brian started to clash with his parents. His parents seemed to approve of Brian having friends more akin to their age rather than his own age. They liked him going to the tennis club and playing tennis, but they weren't so keen on him going out or, or hanging around with children of his own generation. There was one occasion when Brian had been accepted to both Edinburgh and Nottingham universities to go and study medicine. He wanted to go to Nottingham, but his mum and dad wanted him to go to Edinburgh because it was a city that they preferred. And there's evidence that Mr. Blackwell telephoned the admissions officer at Edinburgh University and changed Brian's place. There's no doubt that his parents, and his mother in particular, were ambitious for him. Jackie was very proud of his son. She wanted him to do very, very well. It may well have been that there, there was um, a lot of pressure on Brian to do well, but he seemed to cope with that pressure. Most of the friends at school spoke of Brian as being a little bit cocky, plainly an extrovert, uh, and uh, given on many occasions to telling lies. And those lies became more elaborate uh, as he grew older. Brian Blackwell was beginning to build a fantasy life for himself which would centre around his ability as a tennis player. He was uh, what I would call a very good schoolboy player. At uh, Liverpool College, he was uh, you know, one of our, our best players, captain the boys' tennis team, but certainly, as far as I was aware at least, had no pretensions to be anything more than that. Uh, he certainly wasn't a, a top county player or somebody who was going to make his name on the, the professional circuit at any stage. Brian Blackwell by common consent, was a good club standard tennis player. Uh, but in his own mind, uh, he believed he was far better than that. Uh, he believed that he was an international uh, level player. Uh, he believed that he could make a career from playing tennis. He actually was uh, given a sponsorship by um, a tennis sports firm, but it's their lowest 
uh, form of sponsorship where in actual fact he's able to buy rackets and equipment at a discounted price. It's certainly the lowest sponsorship they offer. Brian on the other hand was claiming that in actual fact he was being fairly well sponsored by uh, leading sports firms like uh, Nike for example and that he was actually being sponsored to travel to international events. Uh, we later found in actual fact he'd actually doctored one of the uh, tennis magazines um, charts of the young player standings which put himself at number one where in actual fact he appeared in none of the standings um, but that was mainly to impress uh, his girlfriend Amal. 17 year old Amal Saba was a fellow student at Liverpool College. She lived with her divorced mother, a doctor and her sister in Childwall, South Liverpool. Amal and Brian became friends after meeting at school in 2001. Over three years the relationship developed and the two became very close as she told newspaper journalist Dani Brook. To me she seemed innocent as opposed to simply naive but there's something very sweet and very vulnerable about her. Brian and Amal uh, met each other at school. They wanted to go on and do the same things. They were studying similar subjects. They wanted to both to go on to Nottingham to read medicine. Their friendship was very much based on an intellectual communication. I think they talked a lot about their dreams and aspirations for their future life. Brian seemed to want to impress her that uh, above and beyond his intellectual capabilities that he was also an extremely capable sports person who was going to be extremely wealthy in a very short period of time uh, through sponsorships uh, and that this lifestyle that he'd uh, invented for himself uh, developed mainly I think at that point to impress uh, Amal. Her close friends did question Brian's stories quite a lot. It was because of their questions that she went on the internet trying to find out where he was seated and it was because of their questions that obviously somewhere in the back of her mind she must also have had niggling doubts. But because he'd overwhelmed her, I mean she describes it as being spellbound, she didn't take it far enough to actually confront him. Amal Saba was getting caught up in the fantasy life Brian Blackwell had created as a successful tennis player and he was prepared to do whatever was necessary to maintain the deceit regardless of the cost. I don't think that Brian was an ordinary boyfriend. He always had ideas above his station. He always seemed to feel that he should knock her for six with some fantastic present. He bought her jewellery quite uh, sophisticated or apparently sophisticated glamorous jewelry which her mother was very uh, suspicious about and rather to Amal's embarrassment I think in front of him asked Brian for the receipts for the jewelry saying that she wanted to have it insured and he never came up with the receipts. He was uh, for someone of such tender years his ability uh, not only to tell those lies but to perpetuate them. And then, certainly in the case of Amal, she could see what she thought was um, physical evidence of the, the lifestyle that uh, he pretended uh, he was about to enjoy. The biggest deception he sought to practice upon her was to uh, say that he could get her uh, a position as his PA. He told her that uh, the contract would enable her to get something in the order of 80,000 pounds as his PA. He went at one stage even further, and that was to write her a check for £39,000. But of, of course, he didn't have the means to cash that check. The check bounced, and he had to um, uh, lie his way out of that as well. When Brian told Amal that he had got this big deal contract with Nike because of his new role as up and coming junior tennis player for his country, that it was suitable for him to have a flat in the same road as football players and to have a Mercedes outside and she believed it completely. He never took her there because it, it, it didn't exist. It put her in a state of mind where she could be under his spell. Because not all teenagers today would fall for it, but she fell hook, line and sinker. Brian Blackwell took a mile on a tour of the most expensive car showrooms in Liverpool, claiming he needed a car that would fit his status as a successful tennis player, even though he couldn't drive. But when Amal said she'd quite like a car herself, it was another opportunity for Brian to show off his fabricated wealth. He took her along 
um, to a dealer's in uh, in South Liverpool and made arrangements to uh, to purchase a uh, a Ford car. He could tell these untruths. He could suggest these fantasies. He was able to back up the fantasies with a degree of reality. So he could tell Amal, I'm a successful tennis player. I have enough money to buy you a car because uh, I have a contract and sponsorship to do so. And when the car arrived, who was Amal to think that Brian wasn't telling the truth? The difficulty was that he didn't have the money for that. Um, and in fact, he had to use money from um, a fixed rate bond, I think it was, that his parents had set up. Uh, in order to uh, to fund his education, it didn't take long for uh, for Jackie Blackwell to realise what had happened. It was probably uh, the first time that his parents had got onto Brian's spending habits. Um, it was a substantial amount of money that he'd withdrawn from accounts held in his name, but very much in trust for his university education. Um, and it was as close as Brian came to uh, being confronted about his uh, lifestyle. Um, he was able to if you like, smooth over this event with his parents, but clearly it caused them some concerns and I think alerted them to uh, Brian's spending habits, probably for the first time. Spring 2004. The fantasy life teenager Brian Blackwell has created as a successful international tennis player is starting to spin out of control. His spending is being questioned by his concerned parents, but he's determined to go to any lengths to impress girlfriend Amal. He was extremely convincing and he would supplement it with documentation that he in many cases had completely forged uh, to support the idea that he was being heavily sponsored by Nike. He was also very careful as well to remember what he had said and what told um, Amal. And uh, we later discovered some notes that he'd made of his conversations with her uh, where he was clearly making sure that he recalled what he'd said on previous conversations because, as they say, to be a, uh, a good lie, you have to have a good memory. So he was clearly keeping track of what he said. But he would produce documentation and to what, in all intents and purposes, was a fairly impressionable uh, young girl who was uh, dazzled, I, I think, by um, the lifestyle that Brian could possibly offer her. I think it's fair to say that he took it as far as he possibly could, uh, to the extent of, on one occasion, he presented himself um, at a bank in South Liverpool. Uh, he told the, uh, the bank manager or the, the assistant that, in fact, he was um, a professional tennis player, and uh, he named the particular tennis centre. Uh, he indicated he was a, uh, in receipt of a salary of some £45,000, uh, that, in fact, he needed um, access to funds because uh, his, his father had died, which at that stage was patently untrue. The financial planning of the Blackwells had been such that uh, money was um, dispersed across a number, of, um, a number of savings and bank accounts. They had saved quite heavily for his, um, his university education. Um, he started to draw on credit cards. He taken credit cards out in the name of his mother, uh, credit ca cards out in the name of his father, and he was using those a lot, but of course that only had uh, a fairly short period of time before Mrs. Blackwell, who was chiefly uh, responsible for the family finances, was to find out. And when they found out that he actually had been drawing money from other accounts, Mrs. Blackwell was extremely upset. Um, it was their investment in him and his future, uh, and she was concerned, and she confronted Brian. In fact, she went to the bank at one time to say that uh, he had made application for a credit card, and that, that the, the, the application form was untrue, and had the, the, uh, the credit application withdrawn. But it didn't seem to stop Brian. He simply went and applied for another card, some in the name of his parents. Brian Blackwell was becoming more and more adventurous in his lies. He told Amal he was going to play in a tennis tournament in Milan at the end of May 2004 and asked if she'd like to go with him. At the last moment, he said she couldn't. They wouldn't allow the players to take girlfriends or he couldn't afford it or whatever it was. So she was left behind, rather to her annoyance, I think. And he disappeared from school for three days. Then she got a text from him saying, I'm just about to go on court, wish me luck, I've just met Roger Federer. And so she was completely convinced. It was another little sort of bit in the jigsaw which convinced her. But because she hadn't gone with him to Milan, there was this feeling that he had to make it up for her. So he said, I'm due to play in Florida in the summer and I will take you with me then. It was 
probably um, something that they've talked about and planned uh, for about six to eight weeks, I think, uh, beforehand about where they would go and what they would stay, where they would stay, and what they would hope to uh, to do whilst they were there. So it, I think she was certainly looking forward to this trip, and uh, Brian was.